Um, thank you for letting us uh, come to your meeting. Um, we were at, we're here because we were actually asked as a committee that is the history and continuity committee to road test this method of reaching ABS members and ballot naive slash curious folk um, to with some relevant content content which might also possibly provide a vehicle for some continuing education credit. So I'd like for those of us who are sort of going to present this thing to introduce ourselves. I'm Laurel Milberg. I'm the current chair of the History Committee, um, and I'm going to be giving some opening remarks. Rich? Um, I, I'm Rich Addison, also on the History Committee, and I'm going to be leading the discussion section later. I'm now going, uh, I'm now going to mute myself so I don't talk anymore. <laughs> Barbara? I'm Barb Hemmenzinger, and I actually sit on both the Council and the History Committee, and I am, for better or worse, the technical advisor for this program. And I, too, will unmute and hope that you all are doing that, except for Laurel now. You mean mute? Yes. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about the purposes and outcomes of ballot work. And by purpose and outcomes, we mean what ballot groups are supposed to do, and what else they can accomplish. So why are we focusing on purpose and outcomes? Well, first of all, to articulate what ballot work can do for clinicians and learners, to clarify what is and what isn't a ballot group and why that matters, and to justify why participants should go through this long, difficult learning instead of a new, getting a mnemonic for five skills to use when communicating with patients. There are many of those out there. So here's how we'd like this to go. I'm gonna present some of our thoughts and afterwards some members of the history committee who are also in attendance here um, may chime in. And then we're going to engage you with our thoughts so you can debate, elaborate, diverge, comment, shoot us down, whatever. Um, and then at the end, we'll take some time to reflect together on the value and potential of doing this kind of exercise, which will not excuse you from the written evaluation form that we send you after this is over. So these are the purposes and um, the outcomes that, we, the purposes of balance groups, sorry, that we've identified. Um, understanding the emotional complexities of the clinician-patient relationship, using that understanding in future interactives, interactions with patients, and making better cl clinicians. And we're gonna talk about each of those things in turn, or at least I am. Here's a familiar voice. Balance work is one of the few methods that actually focuses on what goes on between a doctor and a patient and what that might have to do with the illness or the patient's actual reason for coming. So, first of all, understanding the emotional complexities of the clinician-patient relationship and using that relationship as a therapeutic tool. So troubling cases or patients tend to stimulate negative emotions in clinicians, guilt, inadequacy, anger, fear, just to name a few. And that results in subsequent disengagement from or role inappropriate behavior with the patient, or it certainly can. There are few safe places to admit or explore this. Once stuck in a troubling case, uh, it's hard for the clinician to perceive other aspects of the patient or the case that can unstick them and re-engage them in their, their relationship. Balant colleagues in a balant group can help this by sharing their divergent perspectives and reactions without blaming or shaming. In its place, the clinician's own reactions to the patient or their illness might be used as a diagnostic tool, for instance, what I'm experiencing when I see you or anticipate seeing you as a patient might have something to do with what troubles you. If their reaction, if the clinician's reaction doesn't seem to have any relationship to the um, patient's problem, 
we still have an opportunity to discover our own allergies to certain patients or certain problems, or our blind spots or assumptions, or as has been discussed on Valent L lately, our biases. Valent groups explore the clinician's use of self and their relationship with the patient as a therapeutic tool. We like to call that, or actually Michael Ballant liked to call that, the pharmacology of the drug doctor. So how do we make better clinicians? Well, first of all, by developing their potential for empathic observation, careful listening, and introspective self-awareness. These are things that are practiced in every Ballant group discussion. It also helps by allowing clinicians to return to their or reclaim their proper clinical role when they've been deflected or distracted, often by their own reactions. By encouraging them to seek deeper and more contextual understanding of their patient and in the process discover a more empathic, a more therapeutic, perhaps, way of being with that patient. We also make better clinicians out of our learners by contextualizing the patient and their problem, which helps learners transition from a disease-oriented to a, a patient-oriented care. What balance groups are not? So you know this, but you also know that many group experiences that are not balance get called balance. This distinction matters because the outcomes that can be delivered in balance groups and in balance work are not delivered by balance like groups, support groups, or other mutations reflecting the needs of a training program or a health delivery system. Because the environment and process carefully created in a balance group is often undone and rendered no longer safe when it tries to serve other goals. So what are some more participant outcomes in addition to the purposes? Participants can feel listened to and supported, their reactions understood and accepted, and those are even negative, ambivalent, or especially embarrassing reactions, which can be accepted and explored, not judged. Balanced participants can, be, can become more accepting of difficult patients, or as we like to say, go from furious to curious. They can become more empathic to patients and their colleagues' feelings. They can gain insight into why they find some patients particularly difficult or disturbing, their own issues privately realized. They can work through feelings of isolation, confusion, guilt, or inadequacy. And as a result, by providing a place to get rid of frustrations built up over time seeing patients, Valent groups may rekindle participants' original desires to become clinicians and to better survive the stress of practice. So those are the thoughts that I've brought forth from the History Committee's discussion on purpose and outcomes of Valent groups. But they're here, and um, I invite members of the History Committee now um, to chime in if you feel there's something I left out or gave short shrift. Great. Thank you, Laurel. Um, so I just want to introduce this and say we're going to now throw it open for discussion and we can pick up on any of the points that Laurel has presented or other points that you'd like to. Um, as you begin to speak, please introduce yourself uh, after you unmute. Thank you, Laurel. And um, we'll see where we go with this. So, um, can we just um, take a minute and see, does anybody from the history committee wanna say anything? All right, I did it, goodbye. <laughs> okay, thanks, Laurel. This is Alec Chessman, I, I'm on the council now, treasurer. Mm -hmm. I thought that was lovely. That that shows a distilled, beautiful rendition of meaning. That was lovely. You know, Laurel, <clears throat> this is Jeff Sternly. You mentioned um, 
negative emotions get stirred up. And sometimes um, we might have positive emotions about patients that become disturbing as we get over-invested. And so I don't want to leave an impression that it would be only pain in the neck cases or uh, really troublesome, but it might be a case where we are over-invested and it's helpful uh, to have our colleagues in a group sort through uh, the source of some of that and um, understand better what's happening in the relationship. So uh, some cases can be because they're so good or too good. Absolutely. Good point, Jeff. Thanks. Kathy. Yeah, this is Kathy. Um, I uh, was wondering uh, about your comment that other forms and balance like groups don't work because the changes render them unsafe, changes in the, the format render them unsafe. And I wondered if you could say, or anybody actually on history could say more about that. Okay, good that question. Seemed, that seemed like a big comment. That we could. Does anyone want to speak to that? If not, I will. But I bet some people out there have something to say. Okay, I'll start and then you guys can chime in. But one of the things that we talked about is the clarity of purpose. And a clarity of purpose to do a balance group is different than having clarity of purpose to do a support or a personal professional development group. And so if people come to group assuming that they're gonna work on cases, that's one thing. If they come to group thinking that they're gonna divulge and disclose and talk about their stresses of everyday living, that's another. And sometimes that can get confusing if people don't know which one or if a group serves both purposes. And so um, we tend to believe that it's important to be clear. We tend to believe that it's important to have both types of opportunities for people, but to be clear with the participants what they're doing when, and that generally works best. But I'd like to hear other people's thoughts on that too. Clive, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, it's not, not quite unmuted yet. I'm gonna invite you to unmute. Okay, there you I'm go. unmuted, okay. Okay. I think that a word that comes to mind when I think of balance seminars is training. You're being trained. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you learn through experience and practice. Great, thank you. The pattern that I find happening most often in a beginning balanced group or in other groups that might pretend to be balanced is something called staffing. And that is when a group of professionals get together, what they want to do is to pool their best insights as to how this particular case should be managed. And uh, this completely uh, takes a focus away from the very thing that uh, Laurel presented, and that is, what is the relationship like between the doctor and patient, rather than how do we take care of this patient or how do we take care of this presenter? Right, very good point, Alan, too. It's the kind of case conference uh, or staffing, as you said, uh, view that, that people are often used to, and they've got to get used to a different form, that, and that's the balance form. So actually, that, that's a very good point. We should include that on the slides. Thank you. Barbara. Did you want to say something? Nope, you're still muted. Two things came to mind. Um, one is that the ballot process is like learning a skill. And so 
it's not necessarily, as Alan said, just getting to the end point, how do we manage this particular situation, but what is the process that we can use to collect important data and be divergent in, in how we think about it. Um, so both the, the mechanics of learning a skill by practice and coaching from the leaders in some respect and from the rest of the group. And then secondly, using that divergent thinking that Laurel took us through in her slides. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Play, Alec. Playing off, play off that I was, I struggle with, is there one writer answer than another? So is there one story, one narrative that takes precedence over the others generated is there are we understanding this person uh and this final story is the one that's probably the truest and so i struggle with that and um my tendency is to think not but then that gets a bit of pushback from folks at times too and it sounds like i'm too fuzzy and airy fairy um yeah so i'm struggling with that issue of right answer versus degrees of probability that we're sort of on the right track in general or in the general area of concern or thematically we're in the right area right thank you so that this is a really important issue it it's um uh, uh ancillary to the talk that laurel gave from the history committee which was the purpose of a balanced group but it's it's still very related in the sense that we need to figure out whether we're headed towards the one right or one best interpretation or whether there's a plurality of interpretations that could be helpful and the, then the presenter gets to choose and and you're making a very good point of course yeah frank did you want to say something or don i i'm i'm seeing little movements i'm not sure that those are wanting to talk I think I might have got unmuted. Am I unmuted? You are now. Okay. Uh, one of the characteristics of the Barlin group is that as people begin to understand the boundaries, the uh, assumptions, they begin to feel safer. And it's unusual in many of the settings for physicians, particularly, to um, allow themselves to become increasingly vulnerable in order to gain more from their investment in the group. And I think that's one of the, one of the, important baseline characteristics of a Barnard group is that people hear what it's about, but then eventually they begin to see and then feel what it's about and it begins to feel safer and safer and more permissible to bring one's um, most embarrassing and difficult issues. Absolutely. Thank you for that. You know, let me piggyback on that too, because I think that's... Yeah, Jim, can you wait for one second? Right after sure. Don, it's your turn. Oh, sorry, okay. sure. That's okay, right? Go ahead, Don. Yeah, I was just going to pick up on Clive's comment about training. And I, I the, the <clears throat> way I'm thinking about that is in terms of professional development. And there are, there are many good things one can do for professional development. Um, but there are, I don't know of any others that, that deal with this, the emotional aspect of professional development. And um, that's where I think there's a unique aspect to this that, you know, from, from the standpoint of safety, that, that's very, very important. That's, that's a very good point too. Thank you for that. Jeff, sorry. No problem. Um, yeah, so I, what I wanted to even be more specific about is that balance groups don't, don't start out the first group being safe by any stretch of the imagination. It takes some time for people to get a feel on um, what it's like to be with each other. Uh, they're coming from a very competitive environment. Um, and um, so it's a gradual process and, and part of the leader's role is to support that group's formation and evolution of some sense of safety where people feel safe to express um, a wide range of thoughts and feelings and recognize that they're invited, that diverse, diverse opinions are invited, um, 
and that this is a space, a container, uh, so to speak, that the support, the leader supports. The other piece, uh, another subtle piece to that is that we can create a place, a space that's safe to express just about any thoughts, a wide range of thoughts and feelings, but it's not necessarily safe from our own thoughts and feelings. In other words, we may express thoughts and feelings that are disturbing to us when we realize we have them. Um, and so those are both invited and supported, but sometimes it's upsetting to acknowledge um, some of the feelings we have. Absolutely, absolutely. Good, all good points here. We're, we're really rounding out this whole issue of purposes of balance groups and adding some important uh, features. Good, what more? Clive, are you again? Okay, I'm gonna unmute you. You gotta say yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, there's just one other point that occurs to me is that violent isn't good for everyone. Say it again. Violent isn't the right uh, method for everyone to learn how to be in a professional relationship. Got it. Our experience is at about 63%. I think violence experience is also 63% of people who enlist stay on to the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Kathy, did you have your hand up? And then Paul and, and Allison. I was just impressed by the remarks about safety and, uh, and the sense that safety develops as the group develops. I think mm -hmm. that's an important insight. Um, I also would love to hear folks say more about what balance, uh, when balance isn't good for somebody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so the opposite case, right? When it doesn't work, yeah, that that's very important. We'll get back to that, Paul, and then Allison. Paul, did you have something that you wanted to say? I'm gonna un I'm gonna unmute you. I'm gonna, you gotta accept. Thank yeah. you. Much. There we go. I'm sure. wondering if. Uh, the 37 percent of people who um, do not agree to be trained by us through the full course of a balance seminar um, is it that they don't want to be trained or we're uh, not approaching them correctly mm -hmm. um, not everyone wants training not adults and not even many children they want to go to the toilet where they want to go. Um, maybe, maybe we would want to think about expanding um, ourselves a little bit sometimes. Th that's a very, very big thought that you just talked about. We might have more to say about that in a while. Thanks. Um, Allison. I was thinking about it in terms of seasons. Therapy is not right for everyone all the time. Psychotherapy isn't. Just like balance isn't necessarily right for everyone all the time, though it might be at a later date. So if it doesn't work for you now. So I just, I wanted to incorporate some, some sense of normalizing the thought that it may not be right for you right now and that there are stages of development, clinical and professional, and emotional personal development that we go through and and that there that we try to maybe even talking about the different elements of balance that might be appropriate for different stages of development so yeah. engaging in an intensive or participating in a balance group might be appropriate for one period of time rather than leading or co-facilitating a balance group good yes laurel and then Barbara. Oh, sorry, Barbara. Um, just listening to this, a word came to mind um, that Rex Pittenger used to say to me all the time, 
um, when he was teaching me how to run ballot groups. And I'm sure part of it came from his um, deep um, participation in 12 step programs, but the word was acceptance. Thank you. Barbara. And what I was thinking about was the pharmacology of the drug doctor, um, just as with other specific medications, there are contraindications and relative contraindications and allergies that might tie in to what Allison was saying, that this may not be the right time given the other comorbidities that are going on with that learner or that clinician for balance or psychotherapy. Another time might be better, or perhaps in the case of that individual, not ever. Although I hate to think that way. Thank you. We've taken this very interesting turn in our discussion. And sometimes I think of things as on a continuum. And I see on one level of the continuum as um, balance may not be right right now. There's a developmental schema. Barbara and Allison purported. And then Paul's comment about widening and broadening or deepening or changing ourselves and what we have to offer to people. Um, they, they're on the same continuum, they're not separate, but they're different approaches to what we have to think about. So I don't know whether anyone else was struck by that or not, or struck by other things, but... Um, you know, on, on the first hand, we just say, okay, they're not interested now. Bye-bye, see you later. Maybe they'll come back later. And on the other hand, we'll say, well, what can we do that will make it more appealing or relevant to you now or in the future in some way? And maybe a combination of those both might be helpful in some way. This, this is interesting that the discussion has turned in this direction, though, because um, it, it changes the notion of the topic of the talk that Laurel um, composed from the History Committee's musings, and that was the purpose or outcomes that we're out for. So it's, it's touching that, but it's gone off in this interesting direction. Thoughts, Kathy, and then um, Fred. I, I think it's gone off there because of the uh, attention to safety and on trying to understand in a more nuanced way what safety is, how we support it, what, we, what we're up to. And uh, also because of Laurel's remark that knowing the purposes helps us be safe. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, th I think it's pretty still spot on to what she said, but it's um, uh, about that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Frank, did you have something? And then uh, Alec. Yes, um, just to round out uh, the, the, the larger group of um, whom this might or might not uh, be attractive to, I have met a number of doctors who didn't need Balan training. They weren't arrogant about it. They just weren't drawn to it. And my experience of them was they really didn't need it. So just to bear that little piece in mind, there's a, there's a subgroup of people who are amazingly um, well in tune with their relationship with their patients or open or, or def not excessively defended, et cetera. That's, uh, and then the other one is following on a comment by, by Jeff, uh, the safety issue, and that is, it is possible to go to a group or two, uh, expose some feelings that you didn't know that you had, and not be able to go back for a couple of sessions. And I think we need to be sensitive to, to that possibility. I've had it happen to me, and I've seen it happen to a number of people. So we're bringing up the issue of shame now, too, uh, and safety. Yeah, Alec, did you have your hand up? I did. Okay, would you like I'll to- I'll put it back up talk? again. And then Do Don, you? and then Laurel. So playing off what Clive said about the purpose is training, um, so what it is, what do you expect someone who participates in balance group to walk away with as a skill? Um, and I remember co-leading with Peggy Irwin, uh, was a, um, 
a pediatric uh, psychiatrist, child psychiatrist. Um, and one time I knew more about balance than she did when we started. She knew more about everything else. And at one point during a group, she goes down, grabs her thighs and says, I feel like I'm writhing inside. And I thought, oh my God, what the fuck is going on? It was, um, and from her, I learned to pay attention to my body language, my inner body language. So just to, by way of a crude example, um, a shocking crude example, sorry, to say that I think we do train. There's something that the participant walks away with that they can take as a ballot thing. Good, thank you. Don. Yeah, I wanted to uh, see if, it, if there's value in exploring the other purpose that uh, the balance talked about, which was research coom training. Mm -hmm. um, and the value of a group that is focused on understanding a particular aspect of a doctor-patient relationship um, and I, I do think that, that even in groups where that's not explicitly um, surfaced as a purpose, there, there is a, a quality in a group that meets together over a long period of time of a shared understanding um, that they've, they've come to about um, doctor-patient relationships. Good, a bid, a bid for research. We'll, maybe some other people will have more to say about that. Laurel, did you have something earlier? And then Jeff. Laurel did not have anything to say. Yields to the Senator from uh, Allentown. I forget what the name of your city is, Jeff, but go ahead. That'll do. Um, While missing. Yes. Yes. So I just wanted to pick up on the couple of people talked about, started with Clive with training. You know, um, so much of what physicians walk into a room with is what's in their head. And I think so much of what we do in Balance is to teach people to pay attention to what's in their heart or what's in their gut, um, because there's so much of what they take in, we all take in when we sit with a patient that is not part of what's in our head. Uh, I think Barbara mentioned something about um, using the doctor as the treatment, even, which is you know, a very Ballantian kind of notion. And that um, I think so, or too often physicians don't recognize how much they know about their patients from their own reactions to patients, from what it's like to sit in a room with a patient and what that tells us about them and their impact on us and how we can use that. And I think that's a huge piece of the training that goes on in balance. And we, we learn it from each other. We learn it from other group members. Uh, just I know a number of times I've sat in groups with other folks and I just shake my head and marvel about how attentive, astute, how expressive um, my colleagues are about the emotional part of that relationship. And um, they're not, it's a, not a didactic teaching, but it invites me to go the same place and uh, to find places inside myself that will help me in my work with other folks. So I think that the training is huge. I don't think we think about that quite enough. Um, and I know I very often start with what's in your head, your heart and your gut. Very, very good point. Thank you. John, did you have your hand up a little while ago? I think I missed it. You, you have to unmute. I'll, I'll invite you to unmute. Okay, there we go. Um, practicing in, in the UK, I'm obviously, uh, you know, an ectopic uh, element. And uh, I, um, I thought I've been running a, a group for fairly mature doctors for uh, more than 10 years. And uh, there's a kind of disconnect between uh, the progress that I feel they're making, which is not very much and the great uh, satisfaction they have from being in the group. And uh, I just wonder why this is, I mean, I, I still find, some of them have been in, in this group for years, but I still find it's a struggle to get them to even uh, consider the doctor-patient relationship. They, I think they know they should, but I, I have to sort of keep nagging them about it. 
-hmm. And uh, I, I just wonder why this is so difficult. I, I expect it more of, of residents, but uh, I, I think different people appreciate our groups in, in different ways, and maybe not in the way we think they should be appreciating it. You know, I think we have a lot more to learn, unless your, your uh, groups are very different from, uh, from those on our side of the Atlantic, but can't quite see where they should be. No, I think you raise a, such a very, very good point that we all struggle with, in that you know, we can label it in different ways, but the whole notion of, of our view about what should be gotten from a group and the participants' view or feeling of what they're getting from a group is really an important consideration to, to hold on to and to attend to. Yeah. <coughs> Janet, did I miss your hand earlier? Too. Yeah, thanks, Rich. I just, uh, as chair, chair of the Scholarly Activity Committee and several of our members on this call, um, and thinking about what Don said, um, how do we measure some of these outcomes? We all know these things to be true, but I'm just, it's, it's a tough question, and we're grappling with it in the Scholarly Activity Committee. Um, Right, that, that's it's something that, that we've struggled with for years and years, the concretization of outcomes in a way that doesn't leave out some things that are much, much harder to measure and measure over time and measure across um, many, many different participants and people at different stages of their balance development and their own development about things, yeah. That's such a good point and such a hard thing. It's so good to hear that the research committee is working on that. That's so positive. Thanks for adding that. Yes, Clive. Yeah. Oh, Alan. A and then Alan, you're next. Can I unmute? And then Can you, you hear? Are un you are unmuted. You're fine. Oh, good. I, hear you. I just and wanted to pick up on what John was saying. I don't think that any group is a pure culture of one thing or the other. There's a lot of overlap. If we imagine that we're just a sort of training group where people learn the skill to understand a doctor-patient relationship through empathy and compassion and all the rest of it, we also a support group. If it weren't a support group, it wouldn't be safe enough for people to explore all these things. Um, and so, there's overlap and maybe if a group goes on for more than X number of years, it transitions from one phase to another, but continues, but transforms itself. I, I think that's absolutely true. A group can be supportive without being called a support group or have a main purpose of being a support group. And it does clearly have that, especially for the long-term groups. Clearly. Alan and then Don. This is uh, quite confessional on my part, and it uh, picks up uh, ideas that several people have expressed about various subgroups within the group, uh, a person attending for a time and then not wanting to attend because of what's going on with him or her, so on and so forth. As a therapist, I work with clients because they want to be there. And yet I feel I have some responsibility as a therapist to raise certain issues or to focus on certain things. And when I see that not happening, then I question, what is their value of meeting with me? And so I put that question to them. And I think of one chap that I've seen for over a year, and I very much could say to him, I love you, and I enjoy being with you, uh, but I don't want you coming here because you think there is some psychological problem that you have, and that I am implicitly supporting that idea by saying, yes, I will see you as your, as your therapist rather than as your friend. And so 
I think when we get very invested in wanting to do balance the right way, we may take that with us into the group and think there are certain things that should be happening because this is a balanced group. And I think what's coming out of our discussion today is realizing that there may be people who gain, uh, learn about balance through their body or learn uh, and feel a kind of support in this group. And they aren't necessarily pursuing what we consider balanced learning objectives. Enough. Great. No, very, very important. And of course, the research committee is always going to be looking at the perception of the participants as well as the leaders in understanding exactly that question. Good. Thank you. Don. Yeah, I want to I want to clarify what my my comments were about research and um, it's not about measurement in the way that we typically think about measurement. Um, Ballant was um, an accomplished scientist in his own in his own right, and had he wanted to apply um, traditional measures to a ballant group, I have no doubt he could have. Um, but if I understand the it correctly, he designed it designed the group as a mechanism for observing what happens in doctor-patient relationships. Um, that was the research aspect and it was, it was specific. I mean, it was really fascinating when I was in Porto reading some of Balance correspondence with people that were quantum physicists. Um, and he was, he was way past um, what we think about in terms of traditional um, reductionistic types of, of measurement. Um, so I would caution, having, having a beat my head against this for a bit myself, against the notion that we're going to describe this via traditional measures. Great. I'm on board. Thank you. A few more comments. We have a little more time. Kathy. Um, I just want to underline what Don has talked about. It's the process of balance that is the research itself. And I think one of the things we're training or offering to practitioners is this sense that you always are learning and always are doing your own research. And, and we credit that. Um, Good. Thank you. Okay, Barbara, yes. I am, I'm also struck by the parallel with John's um, mention about how long-term groups may not be making the progress the leader thinks they should with a parallel that I found in seeing certain patients in long-term therapy. And, you know, I thought, oh, really, they're taking such, such tiny steps. There's so much more to be done. And I would ask, you know, what are, what are you gaining from this? And, you know, they would say things that this is important to me. This connection is really important, although they weren't going in the direction necessarily that I thought, thought would be ultimately most helpful, but they had their own minds about what it was doing for them. And I, I suppose that's the wisdom of the group. The group continues to meet and it supplies importance and value. They're the ultimate judges of that. Great. Thank you. Paul. I think, Barbara, you really hit the nail on the head there. That we're looking for cognitive um, trained people. What you just described is how people really learn, is by experiencing the value of their relationship to the leaders and the group. And that is how they come to appreciate the connection they make with their patients. And that is why it's successful. And we don't need them to talk about doctor-patient. We need them to 
imbue it in themselves and apply that feeling to their work. Laura. So jumping on what, um, what Paul said, um, which probably just flew out of my mind because he said it so well. Um, I think that if you, if you think about somebody showing up to a ballot group who's never been there before, which must be very difficult for everyone on this screen to remember, um, it's like, whoa, these people are talking about how they feel and they think there's something about being with a patient that's more than what they could look up as to the dose of antidepressant they want to get. I mean, think how crazy this sounds to the uninitiated initially. Um, and I think it's that, oh, there's a different way to think about things. There's a different way to feel about things. There's a different way, as you mentioned, Paul, to be together with colleagues. There's, a, there's an interpersonal aspect to this craft I'm practicing. Wow. Um, I, th I think it's revolutionary and it has its own impact. Good, thanks. John, we ha and then I'm gonna make a couple concluding comments as we wrap up. Yeah, John, you gotta unmute. I'm gonna... Uh, a patient of Freud's who was the subject of one of his famous case histories, I, I think he was called the Rat Man, and uh, uh, he had a lot, of, a lot of analysis, and uh, I think some years afterwards he was, he was interviewed uh, by somebody or journalist maybe say so what it was like what was it like being into, uh, analyzed by freud and the rat man said i had no idea what he was talking about but he was such a kind man he did me a lot of good <laughs> <laughs> that that's that's perfect yeah. <laughs> this way it raises one of my pet peeves for when i watch some people do balance groups near the end of the balance group it comes around to the presenter being asked in some way, well, what did you get out of this case? Or <laughs> was it helpful to you? Asking for some sort of cognitive appraisal of things. And it's exactly what we don't want to do because who knows at that moment what they got out of it anyway. I mean, that's something that time will tell and sometimes just can't be put in words. Like we had to fill out a rating form with some multi sort of rating right. form. We, we are going to ask you guys to do an evaluation <laughs> in a minute. Yeah, well, th this has been, I'm just looking at the clock and trying to be respectful of everyone's time before everybody has to drop off. Luckily, Rebecca came back to join us, and so we're complete for the moment. And um, uh, what I want to say is, boy, we, we raised some really, really important issues. I can't wait to watch the recording of this and remember all the important issues that we uh, pulled onto the table today. And I wanna thank everybody for participating so willingly with all your experience and, um, uh, and adding to this. And uh, it is much, much appreciated. Thank you for the opportunity to the council for inviting the history committee for doing it. And thanks um, to the history committee for organizing it. And thanks everybody for your perception about things. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're gonna wrap up now. What else do we have to do organizationally? We have to reflect on the value of this exercise. Oh, and, that's and right. The purpose of it, which was, is this a worthy thing to do with ABS members, ballot naive people, or possibly as continuing education? Yeah, so, so really we're talking about future directions here, whether this is something that uh, we could do in this format, in another format, on a different topic, on this topic, uh, uh, intended audience, all kinds of thoughts that you might have on that. So we're going to turn in that direction now to a reflection on what we just did without saying um, exactly what, whether we, it was good enough or not. We don't mind that, but we would like your comments and thoughts.
And they will be anonymous. Everybody will be receiving a, an eight question brief questionnaire that um, please fill out as soon as it's practical for you and return it and then we'll get a sense of your appreciation or issues with content and you may also share anything about the process or the technical aspects of doing this so that it guides the ABS in the future. Right, thanks Barbara. So the, the actual questionnaire you receive will be anonymous. The comments you make here, we will know who said it, so. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, this format and what happened today, I think might be a very rich experience for those people doing the fellowship program at some time during the year that they would be part of this uh, network. That, that strikes me as a, a brilliant idea. Um, and I also thought that uh, y'all got away with having so many people involved um, very well. It was as better managed than I anticipated it could be. So <laughs> well done. So in terms of the process, was the question, um, so to include the webinar, like the slides, and then the discussion also, or were you only referring to just the first part in terms of what we're looking at? Well, what we were looking at today was both. Okay. We were looking to, for the brief presentation of some content that Laurel did to stimulate the discussion for later but to have an actual experience uh, and discussion with people afterwards. What do you have thoughts, well, do you have? Yeah, I think, I think for Ballant Naive people, they may not have enough background to engage in such a rich discussion as we had. Um, but I think, um, as, as some people have mentioned, this would be very useful for people who are in training or have our, our, our leading groups, if anything, just to refocus us, to re remind us what the, what Bound is all about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay, better, for, better for people who are interested in training or for more experienced Bound leaders. Thank you. When I was thinking of the scholarship piece and I was thinking about it's um, now a decade and we're due for our every decade um, rendition of what's being done in all the family medicine residency programs for Ballant Group. Um, I was thinking of transforming some of the stuff into how much do you agree with this statement, oh, Ballant Group leader? But this, this format um, would lend itself well to reaching out to others, perhaps, who are leading Ballant Groups and, and wondering if they're out alone, uh, if anyone agrees with what they're doing or, or if they're connected to the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So we might get people um, who have, who are balanced naive, but who are experienced in other group settings and want to look at our group, or we might get people who are isolated and who are looking for some sort of group process and not sure what that is, right? So that that's a good point to, to vary the possibilities in a Husserlian way and try to or figure people, out. Be or, or people leading about a group and not knowing what they're doing. Just right. saying. Right, right. In addition to the rest of us who are not sure what we're doing something. Right. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. Vidush, an, another. Yes. I think, I think if we did offer something like this to ballot naive people, um, I agree with you. I think the focus probably should be what what is the true difference between what we do in balance versus support groups or reflection groups and things like that. And what is special about balance? And that might be a good rich discussion because we might be biased coming in from, you know, the, um, doing balance, but they might have other really valuable things to offer us in terms of the different types of groups out there and what the learnings are. Right, Tradi traditionally we've gotten a bad rap from denigrating other groups and other types of groups. And I think that your attitude that you express right now is gonna be much better attitude to, to um, underline and talk about. Good, thank you. Who else had their hand up? I missed 